Okay, thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Broken Bread, study number six in our series that we've entitled To the Churches of Galatia. I'm Ron Bailey from BibleBase.com, uh, sitting here at my desk in Reading, and that's Mike um, Coles um, on the mixers and everything else at Exeter. Welcome to this um, virtual scene. This is the mood. This is the scene that I have in my mind. We're gathered around an old oak table, about 10 of us or something like that. We have our open Bibles, and we're just going to work our way slowly through some of these truths that we find here, hoping that it will educate us, certainly give us a greater understanding of the context in which we're reading, but also trusting that God will speak to our hearts in these times. So, welcome. Good to have you with us, and uh, we'll make a start. But before I do, I just want to make... Um, a kind of a this isn't an advertising ploy because you can't get this book now but i've got in front of me here a book called an expanded paraphrase of the epistles of paul by f f bruce now f f bruce was a university professor um and a member of the breadth christian brethren and um a solid conservative evangelical uh, and he he did many things but this is one of the most useful things he ever did because he did his own paraphrase of the epistles of Paul. And he has, on each page, you have on one side his paraphrase, which is a, a loose-flowing paraphrase. And on the other side, you had what he looked upon as being the most strict word-for-word -word translation of the Scriptures, which would, in England, was the Revised Version. There's an even more pedantic version, which is my favorite, which is the American Standard Version. But that really is an excellent book. You can only get it secondhand now, but it's well worth getting it and reading it. In fact, he, link, he, he goes through the letters in order of their writing and links them together with a narrative, which makes a lot of sense, as we've been saying with our context, context, context theme. Well, last time we were together, we ended with this little phrase uh, where Paul uh, was saying that, uh, that God had... Uh, done something for him, and he expressed it like this. He said, um, in verse 4, he said, "...who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen." So now we're ready to begin the epistle proper in many ways. I just want to make a link with that little phrase, "...he gave himself." In some ways, that is going to be a theme of this letter to the epistles. Because Paul isn't really arguing just for a doctrine. He's arguing because something has happened where people have put their confidence in something else other than the person of Jesus Christ. And it was Jesus Christ who gave himself. So our salvation is really only as we put our confidence in him We'll say a little bit more about that as we go on just now. So, um, he usually gives a word of commendation later on when he writes to the other uh, churches that he writes to, but in this one he gives no word of condemnation at all. It's almost as though he's eager to get on with the business in hand. Remember, we have positioned the letter to the Galatians in between the end of chapter 14 of Acts and the beginning of chapter 15. So it's before the Jerusalem conference, as I like to call it, um, and it's, um, it's when Paul and Barnabas have returned from their first apostolic mission. And they've heard of serious things going wrong in the churches in Galatia. And what they've heard is that Judaizers, people who want to get people um, linked up with the law, we'll say more about that in this session tonight, hopefully, um, are trying to persuade people to go in a different direction. And Paul has some very strong things to say about that, as we will see as we go on here. So this is how he begins it, not with a word of commendation, but with these words, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you, who want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, that's strong language, isn't it? And I want to make this point. 
I, I begin by saying that Jesus Christ gave himself. And if you look at this in verse 6, you'll see how Paul really puts his finger on the spot because what he's really saying, by the Spirit of God, of course, is that whenever you take your eyes off him and put them onto an it, you're heading down the wrong track. You're bound to lose out what God actually has planned for you. So notice what he says. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And then he says, which is not another. If you've got one of the older versions, it'll just say different twice or another twice, and it, it's a bit difficult to understand. But there's a subtle difference here in the Greek original of it. Greek language has two different words for an, another. One is alios, which really means another of the same kind. So if you've got red, a red book and I give you another red book, I would use the word alios. That's the word that Jesus used when he said he would send another comforter, another one. It means another one of the same kind, another one of the same kind. But there's another Greek word, eteros, and eteros actually means one of a different kind. So going back to my books analogy, now if you had a red book and you said give me another book and you use the word eteros, I could give you a blue book, I could give you a different book altogether. And that's the point he's making here, that this gospel is not, is not a different gospel. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a different gospel and it's not another. It's, a, it's, not, it's not another alternative. It's actually something quite different. Um, and then he says, there are some who trouble you, who want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So let me pause for a minute or two and just say something a little bit more then about faith in Christ. Not faith in doctrine, not faith in our understanding, not faith even in Bible verses, but faith in Christ himself. And I want to take you to a couple of verses in the scripture, which I think will make this point. If we turn first of all, this is going back now to, I think you'll know these verses well anyway. We're going back to John chapter 5. And in John chapter 5, uh, Jesus is speaking to those who are opposing him. And he says this in verse 38. He says, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, him you do not believe. Notice the contrast here between the word and him. You do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him, you do not believe. And then he said this, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you might have life. I'll pause and go on in a moment or two with this. This is a key thing. The scriptures are precious. Anyone who's listened to any of these studies so far will know my passion for the Bible. I'm a fully signed up member of the Chicago Convention's um, statement on the inspiration of the scriptures. I have a very high doctrine of the inspiration of scripture. I don't know anyone who's got a higher one, quite honestly. But having said that, my faith for my salvation is not in a written text. It's in a person that the written text bears witness to. I'm not saved because I believe the right things about Jesus Christ. I'm saved because I put my faith in Jesus Christ himself. And what Jesus here is saying to the people of his day, he says, well, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. If you know John's Gospel, you know that John is very interested in testimony and witness. So you've got several testimonies. You've got John the Baptist. You've got John the Gospel writer's witness to Jesus. You've got the Father witnessing. You've got the, the miracles that Jesus does witnessing. And now you've got the, here the Scriptures witnessing. But they bear witness to a person. They testify of me. It's the same word witness. But you're not willing to come to me that you might have life. 
you see, all these other things, these witnesses, are in effect signposts. Some of them are more effective and more accurate than others, but they're signposts to a person. And our salvation is not found in the signpost. Our salvation is found in the one to whom the signpost points. Now I'm going to go on and read another little bit of this because it will be relevant to us in a few moments. Jesus goes on to say, But I do not receive honor from men, for I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. And then he says this astonishing thing. <clears throat> How can you believe? who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. According to my understanding of the Scriptures, Jesus is saying genuine faith is impossible for people who depend on other people's honor, other people's approval. If you are thinking about what this person says or what that particular doctrinal group think or what this church says, if that's where you're putting your comfort, if you're honoring that above your own personal relationship with God, you're not going to have genuine faith. Genuine faith is in a person. Real faith is always in a person. We've, we've touched on this, I think, already before, and if we haven't, we shall touch on it again later. And that's that there is a, a verse that is used often in the New Testament, and it's a key verse. It's Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, where it says, God speaks to Abraham about the promise of him having a seed and a multitude that will come from him. And then it says this, it says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And from that little phrase, we get the understanding of the doctrine justification by faith. Abraham was reckoned to be right with God because he put his trust in God. He believed God. He put his trust in God. Yes, God spoke a word and he put his trust in the word that God had spoken. But he trusted the word because he trusted the person who said it. We need to be sure that our faith is not an idea not in a notion, not in a group, but in Jesus Christ himself. And Paul writes to these Galatians and he says, I'm amazed that so quickly you're turning away from him, a person who called you, and you're turning to an it, a different gospel. Whenever we turn from a him to an it, we're in trouble. Let's uh, go on with this a little bit. <clears throat> I'll go back to uh, Galatians now, chapter 1. He goes on to say, It's not another. There are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And then he says this, very solemn, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, anathema. And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed, anathema. This is Paul's absolute conviction that the gospel that he's preached is not an idea of men, but is a revelation from God. And there's no compromise in it. There's no way of um, coming to some circumstance, some mutual agreement, some lowest common denominator. This is the revelation. Now let's go on and see what he goes on to say now. Do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, 
I would not be the bondservant of Christ. Can you see how that links up with where we were in John chapter 5? That a man who puts his trust, who honors another man above anything that God has to say, that person has his faith misplaced. And here he says, Do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now, he's not being arrogant. He's not, um, he's not setting himself as the oracle and nobody else has ever spoken by anybody else. He's simply making this point that he is God's servant and he's doing what he's doing and he's saying what he's saying because he is God's servant. Not because he is Paul, not because he's educated, not because he's had a, a solid rabbinical background, none of those things, but because he has a relationship with God and his relationship with God is twofold. He is a servant of God who has abandoned all his rights and who now just listens to what his master has to say. And secondly, he's an apostle of God. That means he is a man sent from God with a divine commission to bring God's message to other men and women. He goes on to say this, verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. I've missed the definite article out there because it's not there in the original. He received a revelation of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul received two revelations that had to do with Jesus Christ. Here's the first one, a revelation of Jesus Christ. On the Damascus Road, he had a revelation of Christ. He saw the risen Christ. He heard what he was saying. But that isn't what has made Paul the man he is. It's not just that he has seen something. It goes on to say, For you have heard my former conduct in Judaism, <clears throat> how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Paul uses this word Judaism twice in these next two verses. He's the, he's the only person who uses the word in the New Testament. But we need to say this, uh, if we said it before, but we'll say it again, that Judaism, when you read it here in the Galatian epistle that Paul wrote, is not referring to your local rabbi. It's not rabbinical Judaism of the 21st century. It's the Judaism of the 1st century, which was very, very different. Very different. And he goes on to say, <clears throat> and I ab advanced, <coughs> excuse me, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. So he's going to give an account now of why he is speaking in the way that he is. It's not just because he's run out of patience. It's not because he's disappointed in these people and he's bringing them to test. It's because he has a message from God and he has to stand with it and has to declare the truth of it. So he says, he gives his testimony now, and he says, well, you know, remember what the problem is here. The, the problem is for these Galatian Christians in the churches of Galatia is that they have begun to embrace an idea which says you need to add something to Jesus Christ. You need to add something. What you need to add is this, basically. And we've touched on this already in the history of, of how these circumstances arose. There had been people in and around Jerusalem in particular who were uncomfortable clearly with what was happening up in Antioch. What was happening up in Antioch was that people were um, receiving Christ. They were becoming disciples of a person. And the disciples of Christ in Antioch, in Syrian Antioch, first became known as Christians. And the church down in Jerusalem, sent Barnabas on a fact-finding mission. 
They didn't send Martimus to take over the church. They just sent him on a fact-finding medicine. We, we've heard interesting things. Go and find out what's happening up there. So Barnabas goes up to Antioch, and he is impressed by what he sees. He sees it as a clear work of God. It's a work of God's grace. So that kind of settles him, and he stays with them. And he stays with them for some time. And then later, <clears throat> later, he actually goes to Tarsus to find Paul to bring him to Antioch because the work in Antioch is spreading and spreading. And these are people who, some are Jews, Orthodox Jews, if you like. Some are Hellenistic Jews. That's to say, they are Jews, but they have a Greek mindset. But there are also Greeks, thoroughgoing Greeks, who have no Jewish background. And they've all come to faith. They've come to become disciples of the person Jesus Christ. And as that increases, Barnabas decides he will go to Tarsus. This is quite a journey. He'll go to Tarsus and he will find Paul, wherever he is, and bring him back. He brings him back and then they gather together and Paul and Barnabas work together in Antioch for some time. And as we saw last week, it's at that point, that, at, or when they've been there a little while, that the Holy Spirit called the church to release Barnabas and Paul for a unique work that had gone on. The church released him, and then the Holy Spirit sent Paul and Barnabas on this first apostolic journey. So they did their journey through southern Galatia, and then they came back to Antioch. And when they get back to Antioch, <coughs> Peter comes up, and things are kind of turning a bit sour to say the least. He comes up and what happens is that because certain people were there from Jerusalem, from James, <coughs> excuse me, because of that, um, he begins to compromise. He begins to separate from the non-Jewish brethren. And Paul faces him up with this face to face. We'll come across that account a little bit later in Galatians chapter 2. And then, Presumably, Peter accepts that. We know he did from later on. But then Paul gets this news from the churches in Galatia that the rot is spreading, that the churches there too are beginning to latch onto this notion that you have to become a thoroughgoing Jew. What this means is this. There were Jewish people who were quite prepared to accept, to recognize Gentiles as converts to Judaism as long as they were proselytes. They, some of them had a notion that because of the apostasy of many of Israel, God was making up the number that he had planned. So in essence, they weren't uncomfortable with the idea of Gentiles converting and becoming proselytes. But to become a Jewish proselyte, there are three key things, and there still are three three things uh, you, you have to submit to circumcision you have to submit to a baptism and you have to make a sacrifice at the temple in making the sacrifice you are really effectively taking on the burden of the law you are becoming a thoroughgoing Jew so while they were content that people should convert and become proper proselytes these folks up in Antioch hadn't become proper proselytes. What had happened is, in fact, they'd just been embraced into what they see almost as a, a messianic gathering of people who were not true Jews to begin with. Um, but now they want them to f carry out the whole thing and go the full, the full mile, as we might say. And Paul will have none of it. He'll have none of it. Let me go on. He says this. He was exceedingly zealous of the traditions of his father. He's showing that he was a, a true, true Jew in every sense. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, now he's the second revelation, the first was a revelation of Christ on the Damascus Road. Here there is a revelation of the Son in Him. 
And this essence of being in Christ and Christ in Him is the signature key of the new covenant. You know Him, said Jesus, because He's with you. But He will be in you. It's the key thing, not just Christ on the outside, but Christ on the inside. You might almost say that when the story began way back with Abraham, this is how Stephen recounted it in Acts chapter 7. He says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. That's wonderful, isn't it? The God of glory appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road. But there was something more. Christ was determined to reveal himself in Paul. Paul was going to experience a transformation of character that would reveal the character of God in the way that he lived his life. And the Old Testament saints had measures of this, but not with this indwelling spirit in all its fullness. When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, is an interesting thing. You know that Jesus actually forbade his disciples to preach about him. Do you remember this? He said, don't say this until I've raised from the dead. Don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ. And you say, well, this is curious. Why not tell everyone that he's the Christ? That wasn't their role at that time. And it's for this reason that you have to have this indwelling Christ. Only those who have Christ on the inside can be co-witnesses with the Holy Spirit. Others might point to truth, and they may even by use be used of God to bring people into an experience themselves. But it's only by the revelation of God on the inside, by the Spirit, that we're able to preach Christ. To reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I, And we've known this story, haven't we? Because this is what we were looking at just last week. It really is an amazing thing that this encounter that he is explaining here is one in which Christ came on the inside. Now, I suppose the question we're almost inevitably going to ask is, well, when was Paul... Born again, that's the word, isn't it? When was he regenerate? Well, what do we know about Paul? And what do we know about his experience? Well, we, we, we know that he had this encounter with the risen Lord on the Damascus Road. We know that he, um, he does as he's told. <laughs> his famous questions are, First of all, who are you, Lord? And secondly, what do you want me to do? And he goes into Damascus, and when he's in Damascus, God chooses one of his servants, a man named Ananias, who goes and finds Paul and says to Paul, I've come to you, Paul, for two reasons. God has sent me. I'm to lay my hands on you so that you can receive your sight and that you should receive the Holy Spirit. This is the revelation of Christ in him. That you should receive the Holy Spirit. We also know that Ananias encouraged Paul to be baptized and said to him, you need to be baptized calling on the name of the Lord. Paul, I think, from the three days that he was in his darkness, was in a kind of a transition. He had turned, he had converted, if you like. Uh, he, had, he had done the repentance 180 degrees and he was now acknowledging Jesus Christ as the Lord, and he was coming. But he hadn't become yet a disciple in the traditional sense of being baptized in the name of Jesus and becoming a follower of his. And he hadn't received this indwelling Christ in all his fullness. God had been dealing with him for a long time, but now the time had come for him to come on the inside. These are wonderful things, wonderful stories. I'm not going to go on for any longer now. That's our designated half hour for this evening. But please do read these passages of scriptures and think about this man 
and think about what was it that made him the man that it was he became. Not just because he believed different things, but because something happened to him which made him a different person altogether. This is how Paul later described what we sometimes call Christians. He referred to those who are in Christ. He said, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It was this new man that in the hands of God began to turn the world upside down. All right. God bless you. I trust to see you. Same time, same place, next week. <laughs>